Welcome to Where Parents Talk. My name is Leanne Castellino. Our guest today is an educator, entrepreneur, and best-selling author. Dr. Jackie Eldridge is also a lecturer at the University of Toronto, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. She's a speaker and founder of Hearts and Minds Matter. Dr. Eldridge is a certified coach in emotional intelligence and a mother of three. She joins us today from Toronto. Thank you so much for making the time. Hi, Leanne. It's, I'm so excited to be here. I love this topic. It is a great topic, one that we're certainly hearing about more and more, reading about more and more. Emotional intelligence, also known as EQ or, emo- or emotional quotient. Let's start by having you define what emotional intelligence actually is. Okay, so emotional intelligence was actually uh, defined by Peter Salovey and John Mayer. And over time, um, it was really picked up by Daniel Goleman. And so a lot of the work that I do is based in Goleman's work. He's kind of the guru right now. Uh, Many, many people know who he is. And he says that emotional intelligence is really a set of social and emotional skills that helps us perceive and express ourselves It helps us to develop and maintain all of our social relationships, whether that's in our families, our friendship groups at work, in school, how we cope with challenges, and also how we use the emotional information in meaningful ways, because we all experience emotion all day long. So we we can't avoid it. It affects everything that we do. So in that context, then, because it affects so many different aspects of life, How would you characterize why emotional intelligence is important generally? So if we think about our lives, we we don't live in caves. We, We live among people. We live in community. And if we think about how we interact, we are, first of all, thinking up to 80,000 thoughts a day, feeling up to 400 emotions a day. And so we can't get away from that. And sometimes our emotions can kind of get carried away. So, and especially I find right now in our world, our world is very sensitive right now. And there's a lot of conflict, both uh, globally and personally. And so we have to understand how we regulate emotions. And when we talk about kids, of course, that's developmental in the sense that young kids in uh, nursery school, daycare, kindergarten are just learning that emotional self-regulation. We can't expect them to understand it, but we see that they learn it through the teacher directly teaching it through modeling, modeling of their peers, modeling of their teachers, and of course, their families. But as they get older, once we understand that they can actually emotionally self-regulate, we really want to get them thinking about, okay, what is their self esteem like? What is their self-regard like? So the model that I use is by the multi-health systems organization. I find their model of emotional intelligence is very, very comprehensive. And so this is how I talk about it and how I teach and in fact, the assessment that I use. So the first one is self-perception. So if a child doesn't feel good about themselves, they have a low self-regard, they're not really keen on learning new things, and they're not aware of their emotions, that's then going to impact their expression, their self-expression, which is another component. It's going to impact their interpersonal relationships. It's definitely going to impact their decision-making and problem-solving, and it can really stress them out. So all of the items that I just mentioned there are all parts of the emotional intelligence assessment. So it can really affect kids. And once it starts to get into the self-expression and the interpersonal and decision-making end of things, they're going to struggle in school because especially independent. So I'm just going to give you a a little scenario. Um, As was mentioned, I teach at the University of Toronto in their faculty of education. And part of my job is to go in and out of classrooms to watch my teacher candidates teach So when I'm sitting at the back of the classroom, I'm not only observing that teacher candidate, but all the kids as well. And what I've seen, and I'm not going to say this is uh, only COVID related, I think I've been seeing it for a lot more time than that. And that is kids are not independent, they're lacking independence. And independence comes under the self-expression 
component of emotional intelligence. They sit back, they're waiting for people to tell them what to do to get started. They just aren't self-starters. They're not risk takers. And then when it comes to problem solving and decision making, again, I'm seeing a big lack of this. Kids aren't sticking with things. Instead, they're giving up easily. So those kinds of areas definitely affect them in school. Lots to unpack in what you just said, but I, I wonder if we could just hone in on what the parents' role in all of that is. And, you know, what you described essentially starts from a young age when we talk about emotional intelligence in kids. So what does that look like for parents? So we know from the research that kids who come from a home with emotionally intelligent parents, and they're seeing it at school modeled by their teachers, those are kids who are going to naturally develop it because we learn a lot by watching others. We learn a lot by our observations. And of course, kids spend a lot of time at home with their parents and siblings. So when they see it modeled for them, then I think they're, they're more inclined to just pick it up. But I really feel strongly that there is a, there's a, a, a way that we can get to them by setting our intention as parents, teachers, caregivers, we set the intention to understand our own emotional intelligence. The truth is that we all have strength and we all have areas of challenge. And so if you discover that you have an area of challenge, so let's say, for example, impulsivity is one of the characteristics of that falls under the decision-making component. If you are highly impulsive as a parent, and I'm going to own that, I am impulsive. So I, my kids are seeing me do that. Well, if they're impulsive and I don't have the means to teach them and to call them or hold them accountable, that impulsivity is going to get in the way of their learning. So I, as a parent, want to understand what are my strengths and how can I talk to my kids about this? It's also about open and honest dialogue. It's also about accountability. So I might be inclined to teach them the components model it for them. And then there is so much literature out there. So when you're reading to them at night or having them even read their own stories, choose stories. When you're watching TV, you're watching a movie, of course, you're not going to have, um, you know, deep discussions every time you do that. But now and again, talk to the kids about, you know, how is that person showing emotional or intelligence? Or I saw a lack of emotional intelligence there. What do you think? So getting them involved in the discussion is huge. And I would say that I would really want to hone in on the emotional expression and the emotional awareness, especially when they're younger, because we all experience emotion, as I was telling you. But the thing is, if we, if we constantly tell kids not to feel things, they are going to just push it down, push it down. And that's where behavior challenges come out because they all have to express emotion. But if they've been told to shut it down, they're going to express it inappropriately. The other one I would really say is practicing the self-expression, which is where independence is going to come in. So give them things, responsibilities around the house. Teachers do that in school all the time. Talk to them about being independent. Reassure them. Make it emotionally safe for them in the house. So they're not being criticized and they're not being put down when they do take a risk. And, and let them take a risk. Kids are good at taking risks when they're given the freedom to do so. And I think that last one that I really want to emphasize for parents is decision making. So you could maybe talk yourself through the decision that you're trying to make. Talk it out loud so they hear what you're saying. But above all, give them an opportunity to make decisions and solve problems. So I know parents are busy working parents. And oftentimes it's just easier to tell your kid, do this, do that, wear this, wear that, eat this, eat that. I know I was a working mom and sometimes I was racing around. I had two kids who were athletes and it was hard, but we can help them make decisions by doing something as simple as, do you want to wear the red shirt or the blue shirt today? Do you want to have carrots or broccoli? So we're giving them minimal and then increase it the more they get accustomed to it and really, really, really affirm them. And I would say also hold them accountable. 
kids really need a boundary. They want to know what they can and can't do. And they want to know you're watching. They don't want to be in charge of doing something and then you don't uh, seem to care about it. So it's really about all of those kinds of things for sure. There are going to be parents who listen to and watch this interview who say to themselves, you know what, I wasn't raised like that. I have no idea about um, being in touch with my emotions. This is something new to me. Um, how do you talk to that parent about how they can learn to be more emotionally intelligent and aware uh, as they raise their own kids? Yeah, it's it. that's a very important question because the truth is, you know, we all come from different backgrounds, different cultures. Uh, people have different ways of doing things. But the expression of self and emotion is pretty universal. It may be done in different ways. In other words, um, you know, we may we may temper the expression of language, let's say, in some cultures. Sorry, not the expression of language, the expression of anger in some cultures. And yet in other cultures, it's very out there. It's just obvious. It's okay to express the anger. But like I said before, as human beings, we feel these things. And so it's not that we want the kids to be dysregulated in the sense that they're, um, you know, angry all the time, yelling and screaming and throwing things or crying all the time. We want to teach them what people would call these zones of emotional self-regulation. So you you want to give the kids an understanding of emotion. So sometimes it's actually direct teaching of what emotions are. And again, so much literature, so many movies out there. The movie Inside Out, I highly recommend for parents. But when people are um, stifled in the expression of anger, it then turns into a physical and emotional uh, challenge and can actually lead to um, some health-related issues, depression. Uh, we might have to put in anger management programs, etc. But what we want to do is learn about it teach the kids about it, even though you may not have brought up that way. I've been brought up that way. I think for me, for example, I was brought up in a, a house of trauma. So the expression of anger for me was very challenging. I was constantly told not to get angry. And so it took me a long time to be able to get to that place. But I read a lot of books. I listened to a lot of people. I took some courses. And now the expression of anger to me is not a big deal. I can do it without uh, either pushing it down or letting it go in socially unacceptable ways. So I think we want to teach the kids. And I think it's being taught in schools to some degree. So our kids are being exposed to this. So we it's not that we want to copy what teachers are doing, but we certainly want to find out what they are doing, what the kids are being taught, and try to come to a happy medium. And, you know, the truth is, if if it's something that you're not comfortable with in your home, then talk to the teacher about it. Uh, open up that dialogue. But it is important for us, and particularly in North America, the understanding of emotional intelligence is very, very important. You mentioned the research pointing to the fact that kids raised by emotionally intelligent parents um, just have a different, more sort of, I don't want to misquote you, but it benefits them. Can you take us through, and I know you've mentioned some of them, some of them but can you mention some of the other benefits uh, that a child may gain from being raised in an emotionally intelligent household? So let's start with stress tolerance. This is uh, one of the five major components of emotional intelligence. And the truth is we live in stressful times. We live in fast paced lives. Uh, you know, as parents, you're also fighting the social media, uh, this the peer pressure all the time. So you're you're dealing with all of that. You yourself are dealing with all of that as well. And so when we what uh, multi health systems does is they have the five major uh, components, but then they break them down into 15 smaller components. So in terms of stress tolerance, one of them is flexibility. So we want to develop an understanding of what flexibility means. And if anything, COVID taught us that was one of the big things. 
you know, businesses and people who weren't flexible, who were not able to change with the times found it very hard. And what we're seeing as a result of that is a lot of mental health issues. So look at yourself as a parent. How are you flexible? What do you do? Can you pivot if you need to? Can you make changes without it becoming exceedingly stressful? And then the next piece is the stress management. What do you do? And this is something you can do as a family. You can uh, do yoga together. You can go for walks together. So it's about are you doing management through health ish, health, uh, healthy eating, healthy lifestyle? Are you doing things like prayer and meditation that is also part of that? Are you doing, uh, are you talking about it and being open that maybe today I'm not feeling so great? I'm a little stressed. What do you think we could do together to help each other in this moment? And then the last one, for me, this is a huge struggle for people right now. The last subcomponent is optimism. So do we see a sense of a bright future? It's very difficult at the moment because we see it everywhere. You know, news media would have us believe that the world is falling apart. But the truth is there's hope out there. There's a lot of hope. There's a lot of optimism. So maybe we're limiting the amount of time we're listening to the news. Maybe we're not believing everything that we're told. We're teaching our kids to be critical thinkers and uh, critical consumers of news so that that stress tolerance piece is really important because when kids are stressed out and we see this all the time in schools when they're stressed out they're not learning their learning is definitely impeded yeah when you look back on yourself as a mother um is there anything you would have done differently knowing what you know now about emotional intelligence and its impact a hundred percent so i had two kids who were uh elite athletes. So we were running my husband and I back and forth up to the gym, back home from the gym, all over the place, trampoline meets, you name it. And what I would have done differently was I would have limited the amount of time that we were racing around, I would have made a schedule or I, I wouldn't have been so last minute. And I definitely would have had family time every single day where we sat down and we ate together. Uh, we did a lot together, no doubt. And, uh, you know, reading at night, all of that kind of thing we did. But there was a lack for me of that family dinner time. And I think I would have been more open about emotional intelligence. I would have actually talked to them about it. I would have maybe addressed it and had some little accountability in there for them. Yeah. We've talked a lot, Jackie, about, um, you know, emotional intelligence and certainly emotions involving younger children. I wonder if you could take us through what, if anything, changes or becomes more pronounced as it relates to emotional intelligence when you're dealing with an adolescent? Yeah, so I am a huge proponent of beginning this work. I talk to teachers all the time. I want you to begin this work when those kids walk through the door into kindergarten so that they have a basis. But that doesn't happen everywhere. And so when they get to adolescence, they're, if they have not been expressing emotion, now is the time they're going to do it. Adolescents are, first of all, they're so such unique individuals. They're developing that sense of independence if they are allowed to. And so I think it's important for parents of adolescents to understand what adolescence means, to understand that when they get moody or when they talk back, it's not necessarily that they're being mean and you've raised a bad kid. It's actually that they're developing their independence. Now, you, of course, want to put a boundary on that and talk about socially acceptable ways of expressing yourself. But don't take offense at it. So it, I think, is really important to l read a little bit about adolescents. What are they all about? Because they are this kind of weird little machine there that goes on in adolescence. What's so interesting is back when I was younger, they used to think adolescence ended at about 18. But the truth is it starts at about 10 and lasts till about 25. So 
you know, we don't always have 25 year olds who are stuck in adolescence, but I'm sure we can all say we know 60 year olds who are still stuck there. So it's about looking at what are the components of emotional intelligence and how are we going to move them forward? How are we going to launch them? Because that's our job as parents is to launch them into adulthood so that they are happy, healthy, fulfilled individuals. So I would even start talking to them about purpose. Their purpose, of course, is going to change a hundred times by the time they actually actually get launched. But what's their purpose? I would talk about my own purpose, model it and nothing wrong unless you were, you know, a completely uh, off the rails teenager, nothing wrong with talking about yourself as a teenager, what helped you get it get through. And I would open that dialogue, because that's key. Teenagers, adolescents can shut down and we don't want that. How can a parent learn to heighten their EQ? So there's tons of books, tons of workshops. I would read Daniel Goleman for sure, because he has so much literature out there. Some of it academic, some of it quite light. I would follow him on LinkedIn or any kind of social media because he talks about it all the time. Now, I will say Daniel Goleman's focus is very much leadership, but there's nothing wrong with reading and listening to that stuff. So that, and then just kind of saying to yourself, hmm, this is kind of, you know, in teaching, we talk about when I teach my candidates about planning, lesson planning, unit planning, we talk about backward design, think with the end in mind. So how do you want your kids to turn out? What do you want your kids? And it's not to say that you're going to say, I want you to be a teacher. I want you to be a doctor or a lawyer. No, they need to develop that for themselves. But from a social emotional perspective, what do you want for your kids? So then go backwards. How am I going to get them there? It is going to be all of the things like modeling, reading, teaching. I would do some direct teaching of the components. Workshops. I do emotional intelligence work for parents and I get them to look at their own emotional intelligence. What are your strengths? Because part of this you know, truthfully, being a parent is kind of scary. There's no handbook. It's not like learning to drive a car. There's no handbook. And, you know, we're always looking at other people's kids and, well, that kid does this and this kid does that. And why doesn't my kid do that? None of that. So look at what are you expecting of your kids, but keep it to your own little wheelhouse. Don't let what other people are doing, don't let that worry you take some courses, take some emotional intelligence courses to learn about yourself so you can then model for your kids and at the very least talk about it. As you conduct workshops, as you said, with parents, among other groups, educators as well, is there any feedback that you get that has really, you know, that's really struck you over the years in terms of when people hear about emotional intelligence whether they know much about it or not. Anything stand out for you uh, in your experience? A hundred percent. So I do a lot of emotional intelligent work in, it would, intelligence workshops, both with adults who are in the working world. I do a lot with students, my teacher candidates, and then parents. And what I do with them is I introduce them to the five components and the 15 subcomponents and then I put them in little breakout rooms if we're doing it online or if we're face-to-face, -face, little talking groups where they can talk about how they are in relationship to these components. And bar none, I, t I hear people saying, we never get a chance to talk about this. We never get a chance to hear what other people say about their emotional intelligence. And what the result is, is sometimes as uh, individuals, as humans, we can imagine that we live in a box and that nobody else is experiencing what we are. But when you come to an emotional intelligence workshop, you realize, wow, I'm not alone. This is great. So, you know, it's about that talking and it's about looking deep. So I really like to do mindfulness as part of my emotional intelligence workshops, because that opens you up to receive. I think that's what it is. Sometimes, you know, going back to the point you made earlier, Leanne, about the parent who says, well, this is how I was raised in my home and I don't need to do it any differently. That may be entirely true. But are we open to it? So one of the uh, components, subcomponents is reality testing. Are we seeing it for what it really is? And a workshop and talking to other parents can help you deal with that. 
something else that we hear a lot about is empathy these days. And I wonder if you can take us through the connection between emotional intelligence and empathy. Wow, this is a topic I could, uh, I spend so much time on. I will say I am adamant about this. Our world needs empathy right now. Uh, we need to, in order to access empathy, we need to understand it's not sympathy. There's a difference between feeling sorry for someone and being able to put yourself in their shoes, which is empathy. So we need to understand that. We need to understand also that there are people in the world, some of them are in the spotlight right now, who don't know what empathy is. And you can tell who they are by the way they talk. Don't follow that person. Go to the people you know are people who are empathic individuals and, and who really get it. Brene Brown really comes to my mind as somebody that you could follow who talks a lot about empathy. So it's kind of interesting because empathy does not just um, mean that we put ourselves in the shoes of others. We have a friend who's going through something or we have a child who's dealing with something and, you know, we let them talk to us. The biggest thing is learn how to listen. We've lost that skill in today's society. So learn how to listen. And when I teach listening, I talk about we listen with our eyes, ears, and our hearts because it is about empathy. But if we go deeper than that, empathy has a connection to academic achievement. So kids are reading stories all the time. They're writing stories all the time. They're involved with other kids. If they don't have an understanding of empathy, they're not going to be able to access that content. And a lot of it in schools is about empathy. So it also is about how we interact, our interpersonal relationships, but there's a strong academic piece there. And certainly the idea that if you're emotionally intelligent and you're in touch and you're self-aware, then the chances of you being aware about how other people are feeling uh, will be higher. A lot higher. And so they can relate to the things that they're seeing. They can relate to the stories that are being told when they're reading, you know, a novel or a picture book. And they can, the biggest thing is relating to other people. I think right now there's a big push in education across North America. And in fact, the entire world, there's a push for social emotional learning. And so the big push there is going to be for empathy. But it's not good enough to say to kids, um, you know, I need you to think about that person and try to put yourself in their shoes and end there. <clears throat> Pardon me. We should actually be, you know, holding them accountable as well. Do we do things like donate to charity? Do we do things like have them volunteer, that kind of thing? Do we write letters to our MPs and MPPs, like those kinds of things, because the social responsibility is going to be a piece of that? And so do we do we model it? But do we hold them accountable? And do we call them on it when they are not showing empathy? Because that's another thing. Um, you know, and all of these uh, components and subcomponents need to, there needs to be an accountability piece, I think. So um, I'm going to just promote this book, Have You Filled a Bucket Today? This is an amazing book for parents, albeit mostly primary. But honestly, you could translate this into you may not use the book as your foreground but translate it to um your teens your adolescents so the premise of the book is that when we fill someone else's bucket by doing something nice for them by saying kind words appreciating them we're actually filling our own buckets when we deplete somebody's bucket we're depleting our own if we're being unkind to someone or doing something mean and so that premise is there. And I just think I've, I've been in many schools where they use this book on a regular basis. And I think it's important because we don't need to use the book. We can just teach it to the kids. We can talk about it. We can point examples out. And I'll say also for parents, because uh, I see this a lot when I go out into stores, be kind to the clerk, be kind to the server in the restaurant, because that's what your child is watching. That's what they're, you know, coming away with. So those kinds of things are all things that you can bring in to build empathy. Top three areas with respect to emotional intelligence, or the three messages that you want parents to leave with? 
So I'm going to say independence is number one. Allow them to develop independence. Allow them to figure things out for themselves. It's going to help them with their decision-making and problem-solving, which for me is the second one. Get them making decisions and solving problems. Get them understanding. You know, I don't know. Everybody has a different viewpoint on things like allowance and chores around the house, et cetera. But find out some areas where they can make decisions for themselves. As I said, as simple as do you want the red shirt or the blue shirt? Um, <clears throat> and the last one I'm going to say is emotional expression. And the reason that this is one of the top three, and I would say I'm not even sure whether I did them in the right order, but definitely the top three. Because what we see all the time is people who don't know how to express themselves emotionally. They feel things. They know they feel things. Sometimes people actually don't even know that. But they feel things and then they say things and the two don't match. So slowing down, thinking before you speak, because emotional expression is a cornerstone of good communication and conflict resolution. And so if they don't have an emotional expression, so many things can happen. That's one, as I said earlier, physical and emotional health issues, relationships are going to suffer. So I would say those are my top three. Lots of excellent food for thought, Dr. Jackie Eldridge, educator, entrepreneur, and founder of Hearts and Minds Matter. Thank you so much for your time and your perspective today. Thank you, Leanne.